gracious and loving God, help us to love one another as you love us. Help us to understand what a wonderful thing that you have done for us. Help us to live in a way that lives in the new reality which you have created for us. A new reality with a new commandment. The law has not been done away with, but now we are no longer bound to the law, but we live by the Spirit. And help us, Lord, to live into that new commandment, that Spirit of love which is you, which has come through what you did for us on Calvary. Help us to love as you love us. In Jesus' name. The uh, scripture lesson this morning is from Paul's letter to the Romans. And I'm reading from the New International Version of the Bible, or today's International Version of the Bible. And we'll begin with chapter 4, verse 1. What then shall we say that Abraham, the forefather of us Jews, discovered in this matter? If in fact Abraham was justified by works, he had something to boast about but not before God. What does Scripture say? Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Now to anyone who works, their wages are not credited to them as a gift, but as an obligation. However, to anyone who does not work, but trusts God who justifies the ungodly, their faith is credited as righteousness. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend upon the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath. And where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have faith, the faith of Abraham. He is the Father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our Father in the sight of God, in whom He believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. This is the Word of God for us, the people of God. Well, the wheel is pretty hard uh, to improve on, isn't it? Look up here. I've got several images of wheels down through the ages, starting with the Stone Age wheel, moving all the way through to the modern day wheel of the car. You know, from the time that the wheel was invented, 7,000 years ago, not much has really changed on the wheel. Oh, improvement in how it <coughs> is more comfortable when it rides along the roads. I mean, we've got the rubber wheel of today. I would hate to drive one of our cars with a stone wheel 7,000 years ago. But, you know, so there, there's really not been much change. It's round with an axle on it, and it rolls. The wheel has
has remained the same until now. Designer Duncan Fitzsimmons has reinvented the wheel. He's re reinvented a wheel, a wheel that folds, a wheel that collapses. And now it's possible to get a bicycle wheel or a wheel in a, a, a wheelchair that will collapse, that will fold, it will go into a, a duffel bag, it will fit into your trunk of your car, it will fit into the overhead compartment of an airplane, and, and you can take the wheel in places where space is limited. I want you to watch this video now of, uh, of what this new wheel is and does. Alright, this is the first ever portable grocery wheel. You can find it at morphwheels.com. But basically, to make it simple, what you have to do is this before we get into it, it folds in half. So it's like, well, what, what about if it folds in half while I'm like, you know, pushing? The thing is, when the axle's in, the safety mechanism, it will not fold in half. The axle has to come out, and you can hear, there's a little click, and it's an automatic stop, so it won't just come out. But then you can see there's a there's a little clip right here, and there's a blue lever. So the blue clip has to be lined up, and you push this forward and down, and that's what's going to release it. And wherever the blue lever is, you can simply just push it, put it in your legs, table, or close it down. And this pin even goes through or pulls out to make it very easy for travel. For planes overhead, you can take it on the plane where it's most Tires basically will go on the belly of the plane and can get damaged, but you can take the easy when you're on vacation. It makes it very easy to Tetris it in, whatever it is. But same thing with traveling for cabs, it makes it very easy to just go and take it with you. And this is the Morph Wheel at morphwheels.com. Okay. Um, why am I doing this in worship? Because I want to make a, a connection between the wheel and righteousness. Since the days of Moses, what it means to be righteous has unchanged. It's been unchanging. Uh, it, it, righteousness is measured by adherence to the law. In fact, really, that's the whole purpose of the law. Think about it. The law was given to us to ensure us that we would live in a right way, in a right relationship with God, in a right relationship with each other. It was given to us in, so that we could live the right way. And, 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 and there wouldn't be problems and struggles and that sort of things between us. For thousands of years... A person's righteousness has been measured by how well they lived by a list of things that they were supposed to do, or how well the, the, they didn't do the list of things they weren't supposed to do. Righteous men and women were people who did or who tried to do everything according to the law, everything the way it was supposed to be done. Psalm 119 says, Your righteousness is everlasting righteousness, and your law is true. Proverbs 13.5 says, Tell us that tells us that the righteous hate falsehood. Proverbs 12.5 says, The thoughts of the righteous are just. Proverbs 11.23 says, The desire of the righteous ends only in good. Righteousness means doing the right things. We are righteous when we do that which is the right thing. And, and, and when we behave in this way, as I just read from Proverbs, it promises that it will end only in good. In other words, we are riding into glory on the wheels of law and order snapped to an axle of obedience. 
And this is what the Pharisees believe. They believe that if everyone in Israel could keep the law perfectly just for one day, they would be righteous and God's kingdom would come. But we know how difficult that is for everyone to live by the law and be righteous just for one day. Jesus came along and Jesus was proclaiming that the kingdom of God is at hand and that we have to repent and believe that good news. Yet, in Jesus' own Sermon on the Mount, he seems to lay out an even more strict way than what the Pharisees were asking. Jesus said, the law says, do not murder. But I say, do not even insult your neighbor. The law says, do not commit adultery. But I say, don't look with lust at another. The law says, well, you can divorce, but I say, don't leave your spouse. The law says, don't swear falsely, but I say, do what you say you will do. The law says, <coughs> an eye for an eye, but I say, turn the other cheek. The law says, love your neighbor, but I say, love your enemy. Some might read this and say, but I thought Jesus was all, and Christianity was all about grace and forgiveness. Jesus just made things harder than the law of Moses did. And to which I say to both, yes and yes. Following Christ is about living God's way of love. A love that is so great, it, you know, it, it's a love that would die for us no matter how undeserving we are. And Jesus wants us to understand that righteousness, righteousness starts in the heart. It starts with our motivation. Because it is possible that we can do the right thing but for the wrong reasons. In the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus noted that religious leaders practiced piety in such a way to be noticed by others. In essence, Jesus was saying they pray, and they fast, and they help the poor, just so they will get noticed and people will praise them. That's why Jesus said, unless your righteousness surpasses that of the Pharisees and the teachers of the law, you will certainly not enter the kingdom of heaven. You can see why Jesus angered the scribes and the Pharisees and the religious leaders of the day. Because he was pointing out their hypocrisy at the same time he was being more demanding than them. The Pharisees lived their life by the letter of the law. And they demanded that everybody else live their life by the letter of the law. The problem is no one is perfect. The problem is no, not one of us can live the letter of the law perfectly. But yet, the Pharisees, while well, continued to demand that of everybody, and they judged others whether they were living by the letter of the law, without judging themselves. Had they understood the spirit of the law, had they understood what Jesus was coming to teach, they might understand that, yes, God is more demanding of us than what the Pharisees put out there, 
But God is also much more forgiving. Mm -hmm. For the heart of God's law is God's amazing love for us. The only possible response to that kind of love for us, when it's fully realized, is to love back in the same way, to love one another in the way that He taught us to love. We love because He first loved us. All of the law and the prophets, Jesus said, can be summed up in these two phrases. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. In the life, the death, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we come to know how unconditional God's love is for us. How unconditional it is and how freeing at the same time as how demanding it is upon our lives. Now, along comes Paul. Paul, who was a Pharisee. If there was ever a Jew that, that lived under the law that could be called righteous, it was Paul. Scripture says there was no one his age more advanced in living the law of Moses. Yet even Paul, after his conversion in Romans 3, says, There is no one who is righteous, not even me. And in Romans 7, he writes, I can will what is right, but I cannot do it. For I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. If righteousness is what is demanded for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven, there's got to be a better way than keeping the law. Because we cannot keep the law. If righteousness is what is demanded for us to enter into the kingdom of heaven, there's got to be a better way. For God's kingdom to come, for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, there's got to be a better way than living according to the law. Because adhering to the law has been a miserable failure. Jesus. Jesus is bringing the kingdom to us. But it took Paul to reinvent the wheel. Paul actually wrote the new owner's manual on righteousness so that we can understand and take advantage of what Jesus did for us. After years of assuming that Abraham was justified by his works, Paul discovers that he was justified through the righteousness of faith. Suddenly, righteousness can be gained by all those who share the faith of Abraham, even if they cannot follow God's letter to the law. Or law, God's law to the letter. Got that mixed up. Like that cumbersome wheelchair wheel that uh, uh, finally collapses and can fit into the overhead compartment or into a trunk, our religious devotion now collapses into the lives of those who have faith in Christ. For Paul... This is not just wishful thinking. It's grounded in the solid foundation of Holy Scripture. For the promise that Abraham would inherit the world did not come to Abraham or his descendants through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. Romans 5, 13. 
Abraham had faith. And so can we. His willingness to believe is what makes him right with God. His willingness to believe is what makes him right with God. But, but, but what is? What is this reinvented wheel of faith in Jesus Christ? Faith is not about denominational purity. It's not about whether we Methodists stick to the book of discipline. Faith is not about a religious devotion that moves you to, to get up every single morning at 5 a.m. and read the scriptures and pray for about an hour. Faith is, is, is more than a saintly rigor that leads you to feed the hungry and clothe the naked and visit the sick and the imprisoned. Faith is resting in the arms of God. It's resting in the arms of God and trusting that no matter what today or tomorrow brings, God is in it and God wants only what is good for you. That's what faith is. Faith in Jesus Christ is a decision to trust that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Trusted enough to follow Jesus' way. Trusted enough to live the way that Jesus taught so that we are not merely Christian believers, but we are Christ followers. We do more than believe in our heads that Jesus is the way. We believe in a way, we believe it so much, we are living the way He taught us. Trust, trust it. Trust it enough. To believe that those who enter the kingdom of God will have fed the hungry and clothed the naked and given drink to the thirsty and visited the sick and the imprisoned. Not because this new law that they are adhering to is, is something that is a, 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 a demand that they have to do or else they won't enter into the kingdom of heaven, but trusted enough to believe that these actions will be a reflection of your new faith in Jesus Christ. Martin Luther, the 15th century Protestant reformer, once said, good works do not make a good man but a good man will do good works. Even Jesus said that not everyone who says to him, Lord, Lord, <coughs> will enter into the kingdom of heaven. The true sign that we trust Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior is are we seeking to follow him and to do His will. Do we believe Him enough that He is the way, that He is the truth, that He is the life, that if we follow what He teaches, we will have the abundance of life that we are all searching for. Jesus saves us, not merely so we can get into heaven, but so that we can be instruments of His redemption, instruments of His salvation, instruments of His compassion for the entire world. As James said, faith without works is dead. The old law has not been eliminated, but the new law of Christ trumps the old. The righteousness of faith in Christ is trusting in Him. Trusting in Him that He is the way to live. 
that what he teaches is the truth about life and that we will have that life abundant by following him. The person who has faith in Jesus Christ will be a person that we can see Christ in. Amen. Amen. Amen.